I'm delighted to be here. And uh, some of the faces are familiar, which is, uh, makes me a little apprehensive. As you said, I've spoken here before. My, uh, my late and dear mother uh, advised me once. She said, everybody should hear you speak, David, once. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's it, yeah. And uh, yes, I'm lucky enough that I talk relentlessly around the world. I'm just as likely to be here as I am in China or in uh, Latin America or, or, or Europe. And I enjoy what I do. And I'm happy to share with what I know. And let's hope it's uh, of some interest to you guys. OK, so uh, let, let's be sort of big, uh, big view to start off. Population of the globe? Seven point, seven point eight. Come on, come on. Seven point seven. Seven point. Yeah, that's good. You know, you're good. You normally have to watch when people put a decimal point in. They're normally sort of bluffing, to be honest. <laughs> but but if we said seven point seven, seven point eight billion, is that a lot? I mean, why I ask that is that the uh, a billion seems to be devalued. It, you know, when I was a boy, you didn't talk about billions because it was just too large. Uh, and now I notice, for example, in the UK, we're putting sort of fast rail up the spine of, uh, of England, and uh, there'll be an announcement saying, and it will be an extra billion. And everybody says, fine. <laughs> and, you, you know, that's a thousand million. So, yeah, 7.8 billion, that's, that, that's a lot. I think it's a lot because uh, in August 1973, which is 45 years ago, my wife and I emigrated to Canada, uh, and there were 3.8 billion people in the world. So in my professional lifetime, the population of the world has doubled. Uh, we, I might say, added an extra two, and we're rather proud of that. They've done rather better than us. They've sort of stumped up five. But if I went back to August 73, I was a food policy analyst uh, with the feds in, uh, in Ottawa. Uh, and there was a, an understanding we were going to double the population over a 30, 40 year period. And the general view was that Malthus was right, it was all going to end in tears, that the degree of malnutrition was going to just rise. And, and frankly, it hasn't. I mean, there are still something like 800 million people who wake up hungry and go to bed hungry, and that's not good enough. But in general, uh, the food industry of the world has responded, and uh, you know, we've done pretty damn well. However, over the next 20 years, 20, 30 years perhaps, we're going to add another 2 billion. And again, I hear people saying, oh, it's all going to end in tears, blah, et cetera, et cetera. And my view would be just very quickly is it's not. You know, I bet we produce enough food for another 2 billion over the next 30 years. I don't think that's the, uh, the issue. I think the issue is whether we do that in a way that doesn't harm our world, uh, because we certainly have to tread a little lighter on the world than we have done in the, in the past. So off we go. So I'm just, the, the first few s slides are uh, so just relating uh, to, to this. Then I'll get into the food trend stuff. Scribble if you wish, but whatever goes up on here goes on a website. So everything's available, all the slides, and there's a lot of them. But then a lot of them are pictures. Because the guys here said that this group are probably better with pictures. <laughs> D -D David, so that's, that, that's sort of fine. Here we go. So heading to, for 10 billion, so where are we, 20, you know, we're about sort of here, and we're heading past nine over the next 20, 30 years. And that's not a long time away. You can see that. And I make the point, is, that, is it evenly spread? Are we just going to evenly spread the 2 billion that we're going to add across the world? And actually, not at all. Actually, what is sort of sometimes frightening, I'm pro-African. I've lived in Africa for five years. But the population of Africa over the next 25 years is going to double from 1 billion to 2 billion, which is, sort of, I think, frightening. Is that a, a sort of brilliant food marketing opportunity, or is it a social problem? Or is it some combination of both? Probably the case. Uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh are going to add another half billion. So of the 2 billion, that's 1.5 billion is going to be in Africa or in what we used to refer to as the subcontinent. Um, what about where I come from? We're largely static, if not declining. Uh, so, for example, uh, who's going to go down in Europe? Uh, certainly Russia. Uh, that actually, I mean, interestingly, is vodka-driven. Uh, but if we get to, everybody gets very, very excited about Asia, as they should, but some countries are going up and some going down over the next 30 years. Uh, the, the Chinese population will stabilize and then drift down. 
We know Japan, population of Japan is, sorry? 130, a bit less, 126, 127, and that's, that's going down 1 million per year. So if you look at the formal forecast from the government of Japan, they reckon in 25 years it'll be 100, about 100 million. So, so what? Well, can you imagine from a food industry, any industry point of view, operating on that basis that every year that market gets smaller? I think it helps explain why you see around the world Japanese food companies desperately looking for growth. And they know it's not going to come at home, I would suggest. Uh, so South Korea, uh, also declining population. I've just been working in Thailand. I often work there. Thailand, I mean, it's, it's intriguing. It's 69 million people. It's an emerging country. And the population is going backwards. The fertility rate is lower than Japan. It's not something, wow. And actually, uh, Thailand is quite an important country from a food industry point of view, and they're increasingly, a bit like you, they require people from outside. They require people from Myanmar, from Laos, from, uh, from uh, Cambodia. So some countries going up, some down. Uh, I'm in a Canadian as well as a Brit. If I go to NAFTA countries, so that's the US, Canada, Mexico, actually you're going to see quite a growth in population there. Uh, you guys? Let's say 25 million now. It's a, it looks pretty good, doesn't it, in uh, Australia, that uh, your own domestic market is going to grow and grow nicely. Uh, but look at this here. What do I say? Of the 2 billion we're going to add over the next 30 years, let's say, then 1.6 billion of them will be either Muslim or Hindu in terms of their religion. Now, is that just sort of interesting cocktail conversation. And that's interesting, David. I must remember to tell my mother. You know, so is it, uh, or might it have an implication for the food industry? I mean, I would bet the pork guys aren't saying yes. You know, or beef in India, for example. So you know, these sort of big movements have implications for us in the global food industry. Uh, uh, but where's the growth and why people get so interested in, in Asia? It's where you've got emerging countries whose incomes are increasing rapidly. And you can see their diets changing. And there is the opportunity, often as not. But this one, just to get through these quickly, I was really taken with this, just because it put me with my European hat on uh, in context. So if you move right forward through the remainder of the uh, the, the, the century, this is the world population split. You know, it's about Asia and Africa in terms of total numbers. Uh, if we get to Latin America, the purpley one, Europe is the blue, and North America, yes, there's a growth there, but it's from a very low base. You come in the Oceania section, this one down the bottom here, lovely people. You're cracking people, you're super-duper people, and you can get you all on a large bus. <laughs> so, but isn't it intriguing? That's the, you know, just if you think you're important, Europe, I don't think so, in terms of the great scheme of things. Okay, uh, and what's more, the population is increasing, and increasingly they're going to the cities. And I think that's, there's a sort of profound implication of that, to be perfectly honest, because at the moment, we tend to politically and also economically think about countries. How many countries in the world? 196, 198, something like that, right? But actually, it's not about countries. I would say, let's move forward 20 years or so, it's about cities. And there will be roughly, give or take, 600 cities in the world that will be those mega cities. And they will have more in common with each other than the countries. And that's where a lot of the action will be. And you know, again, when we hear people say, uh, we're hoping to focus on the Chinese market, you say, oh, really? You know, why not the, you know, let's pick a city. Which, and just to make that point, if you take the top tier 1 to 10 cities in China and look at the city GDP, city GDP, so Shanghai, number one, no surprise there, then its economic clout is the same as the Philippines. Population, 100 million. So back to the Chinese market. What's the Chinese market? Let's go to Chengdu, 
the beautiful and brilliant city of Chengdu, as you know, will, which is the sort of capital city of Sichuan province, where the lovely sort of lip-numbing food comes from, has the same GDP clout as Norway and double the GDP clout of New Zealand. You tell your Kiwi friends that. They don't like that at all. <laughs> you know, they're a bit up themselves, frankly. So there you go. It's about cities, I would suggest. And that's the focus. Uh, and I mean, sometimes, if I can just sort of go off, off piece, I was doing some work in New Zealand uh, recently. And at the moment, if you look at tourism into New Zealand, then number one is Australians visiting New, uh, New Zealand. By 2020, they will be passed at a rate of knots by the Chinese. And we were doing some quick calculations. 2020, they'll need 28 more aircraft per day going into New Zealand just to cover off that tourist traffic. And they'll be doing it not from Shanghai or from Guangzhou, but from cities right across China. So let's take Chengdu again. There will be a direct Chengdu to Auckland. And, you know, so what? Well, if you're in the cherry business in New Zealand, that's bloody good news, because suddenly you have access to Chengdu, which is quite a, you know, quite a way into China, direct. On the, so, you know, there are opportunities here. Hang on, going back, I've got to go back. I was taken the other day by FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, you all know that. They put out their estimate of changes in agricultural production by 2050, which is climate change induced. So wherever there's green, the suggestion is that it will be either stable or better. And where it's red or pinky, then they see problems. OK, I, first of all, I was surprised that it wasn't red here, to be perfectly honest. I thought you'd be more red. But uh, what's the country that they believe will benefit most, if you will, from anything to do with climate change? Canada. And why is that? There's not a lot of people farming north of Canada. You know, if it gets a little warmer, brilliant. You know, that, that's it. But, I mean, why do I put this up? It's because when I saw that, I just sort of linked it to those population forecasts and thought, all the areas that look as if they may be more stressed in terms of food production are where the extra people are coming. And I think that is profound. I mean, apart from showing you that there's opportunity for producing countries which are going to still manage to do and export well, uh, but I, I think more profoundly, if we think we've had an immigrant problem to date, then I don't think we've started. And if I think, let's, uh, let's go to Europe, for example, where there's been such a fuss, political fuss about Syrians, etc., cetera, uh, Africans moving to, uh, trying to get across the Mediterranean. I don't think we've started in that. Uh, so, for example, if we take, uh, let's go to, to uh, Bangladesh, for example, population of Bangladesh, I don't know, something like, uh, what's population? You, you're smart at the back there. Yeah. The population of Bangladesh, about 170 million, something like that, in a country the same size as Wisconsin, and over which half the country is below sea level. Now, do you think there may be a little problem there over the next 20 years? And what will happen when the, the, they have a problem? They'll start walking. They will walk, and they have to end up somewhere. And it's just a reminder to me that you know, the, the, that problem isn't a Bangladesh problem. That problem is a global problem, and we have to manage that. Same with Africa. I mean, I see uh, here big movement going that way. That becomes our problem, and we have to sort of just embrace it. That's by the by. Don't want to be somber, but just I thought I'd sort of slip that in while I can. Why wouldn't I? And so, but back to your region, uh, you know, and if you look at the wider uh, GDP growth projection for Asia, it's a sort of Brilliant picture. I mean, here we are with countries which are pretty close to you and are growing at a rate of knots we haven't seen in Europe for decades and won't see. And even by North American standards, are absolutely excellent. Uh, as I said, I was in Thailand the other day, and I mean, this is the disappointment. 
a country like Thailand is just, just not growing as fast as it should. You know, you've got to be getting over 5% to see that real lift in terms of uh, dietary change, uh, for, for, for example. Uh, so I think you know, that's uh, super duper for you from an export point of view. It shows that you know, countries around you are improving, changing their diets, etc., increasingly looking at premium products. Uh, and why wouldn't they? Uh, mind you, I think you've also got to put that in the context. Let's take the Philippines, growing at close to 7%, and increasingly looking, as I said, if you, that lady who shops in Manila, uh, traditional market, wet market, um, she's just starting to have enough money for the household that she might consider, say, on meat. They like meat in the Philippines, perhaps buy some beef, perhaps buy some imported beef. Yeah, terrific for you guys. However, I think it's fragile because if you again link that to climate change, if you will, uh, what happens uh, if there is a problem, uh, a climate problem that relates to rice production? Easily done. You know, remember, there's a very few exporters of, uh, of rice. What happens if the price of rice doubles, which you can do very quickly? Does that lady in Manila market, does she say, oh, I'll buy less rice? Nah. She'll probably buy more rice. It's, in economic theory terms, it's a, an infer so-called inferior product, that she's got to secure food for the family Rice is still relatively inexpensive, so she'll buy more. What will she buy less of? Beef. Beef, yeah, you know, that stuff. You know, the stuff she was just getting used to, the dairy product, perhaps. So uh, I think there's sort of fabulous opportunities emerging, but then it's more volatile. And I think, so from an exporter point of view, it, you've got to sort of balance that. You've got to have a portfolio uh, where you've got some, you know, maybe sleepy old Europe, but still rich, or, or North America, but still emerging Asia, which is so, so exciting. Uh, yeah, then I've done that one there, purchasing power of countries, wow. But then what you've got to remember for these other countries, as I say, that they're not, they have different food cultures. And then when I'm in Australia and in many countries, there's this sort of naive view sometimes that everybody sits down to, you know, beef and uh, three veg, you know, something like that. It's a nonsense. So I was in KL the other day, and the next door table to me, there I was sadly eating by myself. And that was the table next to me that had had eight Chinese guys having their meal. And I thought, that's not a very European approach. Is it? So what do I mean by that? I've done this with uh, uh, some of you before. I mean, how do we put a meal together in Australia? What do you start with? A big plate. Not a little plate, a big plate. And a <laughs> what do you put in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> a great slab of meat. I mean, do you guys eat meat? You eat over 100 kg per capita. How you've got the time to be here, I've no <laughs> bloody idea. I mean, you should be home gnawing on the rear end of some large animal. God love you. And then what you do is sort of dot round it, little bits of green and what have you, the sort of thing that Mrs. Antonio would like her son to eat. You know, that's it. That's what she'd like, yeah. And that's our meal, and that's mine. It's not yours, it's mine. And I'm going to eat it all. Because it's mine, and if I don't, what about the starving? And I've never fully got the link between me leaving my broccoli and the starving of Africa, but I'm sure there is a link. There's, there's a, a link there. That's, so that's, that's it. Now, is, you know, how would, what about an Asian meal? Well, it's a little bit of this. It's a little bit of that. There are eight people. There are 16 dishes. We share it all. You don't finish it, or else another one arrives. You know, it's, it's, it, it's so different. And it's pretty basic market research, and it's understanding those customers. Uh, so I'd say, you know, back to meat, for example, we can say, well, we've got great quality meat. Well, fine, but if that meat is used shaved and then doused in a delicious sauce, frankly, you wouldn't know if it was pork or beef. You know, so, you know, there are issues here. It's understanding the consumers. It's pretty, pretty basic. That's all I say. And then lastly on this, every Saturday I get a comic. It's The Economist. I sit down over a cup of coffee, and I just saw this the other, uh, about two weeks ago. It's 
slightly worrying. What have we got here? It's, uh, this is contribution to total global growth. So, okay, that's the US, India, and China. Okay, so what do I notice that like two-thirds of, give or take, of global growth is driven by three countries. Uh, and it's just a reminder to me, well, let's hope they keep on growing. You know, so, for example, if suddenly there's a problem in India or China and they don't continue to grow at 6 or 7% per year, then that becomes everybody's problem. And I can't ex we can't expect that. to. We know there'll be hiccups. So again, what do I see? That you know, If you look out, you're gonna, there are going to be ups and downs. And are you resilient enough? How can you put that into your business planning, I, I would suggest. So if actually when India and China's growth slows, we better fasten our seat belts. That's all I'll say. And, but you know, at the weekend, I was in Siem Reap. It's a lovely little town for me in, in Cambodia. It's a nice place where I can sit and get some work done. I always go to the traditional market. I was down the beef section. There it is. Uh, and take my picture uh, every time I go there. So that's me, in, you know, me taking the picture. My eldest son was in Manhattan uh, doing some work. And he sent me... Uh, at this, he, he was in a restaurant, the Impossible Burger. The Impossible Burger is the plant-based burger that is very fashionable in uh, uh, the U.S. and elsewhere at the moment. And I thought, you know, wow, there's such a gulf, if you will, between those of these emerging markets and so-called so developed markets. And I'm often asked, you know, the trends you talk about, David, uh, where is their relevance to country A versus country D? This slide is just to say that I think that while markets seem to be poles apart, that in terms of many of the trends that I'll talk about now, they're narrowing and not least because of social media. That I would suggest when I'm in China uh, talking with my Chinese millennial friends, so this would be like a 30-year-old Chinese couple who are well-educated, have good jobs, etc., that they have much more in common with their peer group in the U.S. than they certainly do with their parents. They, they know that's a different era, and that concerns about issues, social issues relating to food now sort of move so quickly across the globe, just they're gone. And so those trends are tending to converge, I, I, I would suggest. That's my point. So I'll to the flick through some, uh, oh, it, it's so premium. It's about premium, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so what is premium? Uh, and as I say, premium, it's not just, doesn't mean higher price or reserved for a special group of people who are really high income or for very special occasions. Uh, no, premium, it's, it's about story, people, places, tradition. You've got to have real distinctions in quality. Uh, it's about trust. You know, I believe your story. It's transparency and trust. It's about that pleasure and discovery. Uh, I, as I said, last week I was talking to egg guys, so I've just used an egg example for what it's worth. Uh, and here we go. This is, uh, bear with me, that, that I've used this for two or three years now, but I believe in it. Look, if, we, if I stick with meat, uh, I think, if I, let, let's take beef for no good reason. Beef is the commodity. And I don't know if the margin is in the commodity. Beef is the noun. The margin is in the adjectives. What sort of beef? Is it grass-fed or dry-aged or whatever? That's where the margin is. So in this particular case with the egg guys, oh, I haven't changed the, 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 this is in Thailand. So what's the story wrapped around your eggs? How do you like your eggs? It's not fried, stir, you know, or poached, no. It's I'd like my eggs with adjectives, please. You know, are they free-range, local, rare breed, vegetarian-fed, organic? Farmer, Smith, Smith omega-3, etc. The margin is in the adjectives. And that is about the story, which is really important. And so just to give you one example of an egg with some adjectives, uh, I mean, the, the other day I was in uh, Madrid, and here we are. Here were huevos trufados, so truffle eggs. Okay. And what were they selling for? 13 Oz for six eggs. Eggs are the commodity. They're the noun, eggs. The adjective 
is the truffle. That's where the, I mean, how do you think they make truffle eggs? These are fresh eggs. Yeah, in a jar with a truffle. Thank you, well done. Actually, it's not in a jar with a truffle. It's in a polystyrene box where you've got the uh, layers of eggs and then you put truffles on the top, put the lid back on, leave it for three days and it takes up the aroma, the essence of the truffles. And then you pop them in and sell them at two bucks a pop. Not bad. It's in the adjectives, I would suggest. Huevos trufados. Okay, so what about some sort of basic consumer trends uh, which hold up, particularly in higher income markets, but increasingly around the world, it's in urban markets. I would suggest that single-person households. So uh, in the U.S., it's now it's 30% of all households are one person. Okay. In uh, Amsterdam, 60% of households are one person. Oslo, same. London, 50% of all households, one person. So what? You know, is that, again, sort of interesting cocktail conversation? Or might that have some implications for us in the food industry? You know, would you, if you're a one-person household at work, do you then say, what am I going to have this evening? Lamb shank stew. I think I'll buy one of those, pop home, pop it in the oven for two and a half hours, with some nice vegetables, and then dine sumptuously by myself. <laughs> no, no, no. You're much more likely to eat out. You're much more likely to have something sent in. You're much more likely to stop on your way home and buy you know, a ready meal. You're much more likely to say, no, I'm going to do the cooking. You stop wherever you are, and you buy meal components, bang, 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 and then bolt them together and then proudly tell yourself, I've cooked. <laughs> That's it. So you know, this is hugely important. And I, you see it all around the world. And you've got to look at your own products and say, are they in a sort of one-person one format? You know, are they available? Can you sell them to one person? Uh, uh, here's another one, slightly. You, you see this in maybe not so, You're so bloody car-bound in Perth, for God's sake. This, I don't know if it works in Perth. But here we are in the US, it's exactly the same in the UK, that uh, millennials, so any, but this is anybody under the age of 35, progressively abandoning the, the idea of driving. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, just to put it in context, so my youngest son is 42. In the UK, you can, you are, you can get a provisional driving license when you're 17. On his 17th birthday, May the 18th, he was queuing at the post office until it opened. Son, you know, 17 to the minute, and then, right, mum, can we go out driving? And now, why would you bother? If you're in London, I don't, want to, I don't want a car. Why would I want a car? It's a pain in the ass. Where do you park it? It's expensive. Uh, in, in London, you've got a, uh, an extra tax on having the, uh, the, the car in London because there are so many cars, cars there. Uh, and, and you can see it already emerge. If you want a car, you just rent it. And, you know, with new rental systems where you can say, I want a car between two and four. And it, just like the bikes that you can get, and then you sort of jump into the car and go. You can see this happening right round. Well, so what? And I think it has huge impact on where and how young people shop, for example. I mean, and remember, that's the under 30 lot. You know, you've got to watch them like a bloody hawk. You know, just one example here. Here we are with the lighter eating pizzas for one. I mean, just a, any product, you can, you can pick thousands of products like this. Uh, as it happens, let's take Oslo, for example. In Norway, Oslo, more than half the population of Norway are in Oslo. Uh, it's got the highest divorce rate in the known world. 60% of households are one person. Uh, the Norwegians are lovely people and are very, very hard working. And they work the backsides off in, in little offices, little cold offices. And then they race home, slap a one-person pizza into the microwave, zap it, because it's very expensive to eat out. So woof it down, and then sort of bite their tongue, and out they go to often an, extra, an exorbitant wine bar on, you know, on the off chance that they might find a mate. It's, <laughs> it's, awful. it's awful. Oh, my God. 
So I, I think, you know, you've got to focus on that, that next generation of influencers, shoppers. The younger, the higher affluence, the social media savvy, the early tech adopters, and they are right in there engaging in future trends. Uh, and they represent in the UK, and they will do in Australia too, a quarter of the British grocery shopper population, but they have a disproportional influence. And I use this little thing here, uh, which is uh, Veruca Salt. Yeah, remember Veruca Salt from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which you might have read to your, your children, grandchildren, my, my, my kids. And she was this spoilt brat. She wanted the golden ticket, and she I want it now. Uh, a bit like, now. And that's millennials. Uh, when would you like it? Now. What, tomorrow morning? Wouldn't it? No, now. Want it now. And from a, you know, so from a service provider point of view, can you deliver it now? I want it now. And that came home to me to about how impatient they are. I was talking in uh, blah, 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 uh, Dublin at a, an event, and the uh, marketing director for Google was there, and she was making the point that Google had done some research saying, how long would a millennial and younger stick on your website before they moved on if they hadn't got the point. And the, the result was you lost 52% of viewers if they didn't get it within three seconds. Okay, so it's click, one, two, three, don't get it, gone. Just go back to your websites and have a look at them and say, you know, I mean, when I, I've got a pathetic website, it's just me, and, and you know, I don't fiddle faddle with it. I should get somebody who knows what they're doing to do something about it. But you know, you're thinking about, well, perhaps on page two, I'll say, page two? They won't get near page two. No, you know, is it something, some clever trick they've got to do to get into the video or whatever? They won't do it. They will not do it. Better be in your face, for God's sake. There we go. Uh, yes, then it was the, uh, here we are with the, you know, this, this driving thing. I think it's sort of fascinating. My, my older son is uh, 44. He didn't get a driving license until he was 34. Uh, he was forced into that by his wife, who was pregnant. And she said, we're not going to get an Uber <laughs> to the hospital. <laughs> you know, Blake, you're going to have to drive me. You know, Blake, oh, all right. You know. so, so reluctantly, he's... Got him. Okay, so if you go to higher income countries, as I say our diets and eating patterns are being influenced what by? By mobile te te technology and AI, artificial intelligence. This is so important, I'll come back to it. This rising healthcare costs and a focus on well being and this sort of new generational influences. This sort of health thing is, as we know, it's a big deal. Uh, again, I'll mention it just br br briefly in a, in a minute, but say in the UK right now, then the cost, the National Health Service cost for diabetic disease in the UK is 20 billion Oz per year. You know, that's not a made up figure, that's what it costs. So in my country, that's the taxpayer. And taxpayers and governments are saying, we can't afford that. We just cannot afford that. There has to be something else we can do which is in the hands of the individual. And so, and they're starting to say, we better take decisions about what we eat and when we eat, et cetera, which have a different outcome than we've got at the moment, I would suggest. Okay, so moving on, it's sort of health related. Customized diets. Let, let, let me ask a question. Uh, for somebody of a great age, it's me. I, mean, I can remember when I was in infant school. And if I went back to when I was like six, let's say I was six, so that for me would be like 1954, can you imagine? Dear Lord. Think, and you think back to when you were, if you can, six. I can't remember anybody in my class that had a special diet. No, not one. Can you? I mean, in your class was there a whole pile of people, no, I'm, uh, you know, paleo, I'm just a... No, that's uh, uh, lactose free over here, please. You know, do no. Now, what I find slightly worrying, if I again think back, that after the summer holidays, not everybody came back. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, bugger. You know. But you know, and now, you know, on an airplane, uh, because I just have a regular diet, I'm the last one served. You know. 
Like, uh, they don't ask who's got a special diet. The, in the 70s, they asked uh, who's got a special diet, and two people would, with embarrassment press the, the key. Uh, you know, and, and it was appalling you know, for the individual, particularly if you were male. A male and on a special diet. Really. So customized diets, what's that about? 44% of US co consumers say they've tried various approaches to eating and dieting in the past year. Yes, and you see it reflected, of course, in food products. Here we go with uh, you know, Bailey's Irish Cream. Great stuff, super, isn't it? When you're having fun, well, this is Bailey's Irish Almond Cream. Uh, Here's Unilever with its Magnum, you know, the best-selling ice cream worldwide, with the vegan version in Scandinavia, as it, as it happens. Uh, so, you know, and, and these, were, are they fads or are they niches and what size is that niche? They're substantial. They are substantial. Uh, I, let's go on. Um, Unilever, PG Tips is the biggest brand of tea in the UK and they have a special PG Tips for those who like tea with non-dairy milk. You know, what? It's amazing, amazing. Uh, mind you, as I say, I saw this the other day, and just which one would you want? <laughs> Here's uh, Campina Melcuni, you know, a big co-op in, in, in Europe. There's their milk, and uh, what's the ingredients? Milk. And this is almond, this is the ingredients there. And so, you know, whether that those sort of plant-based milks I have got legs in the longer term, I don't know. At some stage, somebody's going to say, hang on, you know, I thought you said it was almond milk. There's only bloody two almonds in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So which one do you buy? Uh, and, uh, actually, but it's still on plant-based uh, milks, etc. is it just a silly American or European thing? No, it's a big deal in China. It's a very big deal in China. And I don't think we've got a panic here if you're in the dairy industry. It just gives you more opportunities, more product opportunities. More segments, for goodness sake. Great, brilliant. Uh, or something, this is made in uh, FODMAP. How many people, anybody FODMAP? We know what FODMAP is. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a, a diet for those who are concerned about IBS, about irritable bowel syndrome. It comes out of Monash. It's increasingly influential. If you think that gluten-free is an issue, uh, around the world, celiacs, maximum 3% of the global pop would be bona fide celiacs, but the better part of 15% of the world believe that they have an irritable bowel problem. Not full-on IBS, but a problem. And so here's FODMAP, and I just picked up which, of the, you know, which foods are on the naughty step for FODMAP. These, for example. For example, as I say, made in Australia. I see this in, in Europe now. Uh, I was in New Zealand, as I mentioned the other day, and I was in Woolies, which is countdown in uh, New Zealand, and here we are, FODMAP for you. So, you know, products which are specific for that, uh, that, that problem. So increasingly, you can see it's sort of interesting from a food product point of view. It means you see this proliferation of, of, of products. Don't panic, because I think it just gives you opportunity. And I wanted to talk very briefly, too, about, look, here you are, you guys, at 100 kg per capita meat. But in almost every high-income country in the world, Meat consumption is at best static, but actually declining in most on a per capita, on a per capita basis. Okay, on a per capita basis. And why would that be the case? Well, if you look at in the UK, it's very similar to in many other countries, including Australia and New Zealand. Uh, why are people cutting back? Perceived to be better on your health if you uh, have lower your meat consumption. Weight management issues, animal welfare concerns, the environmental, oops, concerns about antibiotic, uh, hormones, etc. Et and for the people who are challenged economically, it's just cheaper to cut out meat. Not cut out meat, but to reduce meat. And if I look at, look, 91% of us in the UK are carnivores or omnivores. It's only 9% are non-meat eaters, but they're an influential group because, you know, it's, uh, they tend to be female uh, and t younger females. But I think it's more than that. I think there's... Uh, it, it's more profound. Again, back to when I was in New Zealand very recently. New Zealand, they eat as much meat as you guys do. Uh, and I think it's against the law in New Zealand to be vegetarian. <laughs> but, 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 by the way, but, that's, uh, but I, was, uh, I wasn't working for or at the university, but I was downtown where the universe, where University of Auckland is, is sort of based. And I went out for an evening meal by myself, unfortunately. And I tried six restaurants before I found one that sold meat. 
in, in the main meals. They were just all vegetarian. You know, and it's, it is something happening out there. You know, so and let's be aware of it. So say in the UK, is this, it's not the rise of veggies. It's the rise of flexitarians. Uh, and what's that about? That's where people say, we're going to eat meat, but we're going to eat less, and we're going to have more meals which are veg vegetable-based. Where you know, Wednesday will be a vegetable day, or whatever it might be. As I say, they tend to be female, younger, high earners, people living in cosmopolitan centers, etc. Et Here's a, uh, a uh, men's health is a uh, magazine for men who are sort of interested in body shape, etc. There's now a very successful brand called Men's Health Kitchen. Here we are, lean pork sausages. Actually, what that is, 50% pork, 50% haricot beans. What do they taste like? Great. Uh, if you look at the, you know, why would you eat them? Lower fat, higher fiber. Uh, they've got a stealth vegetable in if you're a mum and trying to get veg into your, your children. It's uh, yeah. brilliant. Why wouldn't you? Do you think the, that's got legs in the market? I would think so. I would think so. And for men now, it's cool, not wussy, for men to be concerned about their health and about their looks. Now, it's okay, you know, you don't have to be a closet vegetarian if you're a male. Why not? Uh, the other day I was in Red Deer, which is between Calgary and Edmonton in Alberta, and I was just trying the Beyond Meat burger. You'll know all about this, I'm sure. A&W is owned by PepsiCo, uh, and it's you know, one of the great burger chains in the, U the U.S. This is a plant-based burger. I was lucky enough to get it because it was launched, and they couldn't cope with the demand. They've had to double production. It was 15% more expensive than the, the regular burger. I mean, I tried it. Here it is. It looks like a regular burger. Uh, it tastes like a regular burger. It's maybe a little softer in mouthfeel, maybe a bit, bit softer in mouthfeel. But, you know, it, it, it's a Wednesday burger. It is not a I've got a hangover burger. You know, you know, where you want the full fat running down your chin, the works burger. No, not for that. But it's a Wednesday burger. Has, will it find a place? Absolutely, it'll find a place. And it was really intriguing. Uh, I was talking in Edmonton, and the guy who was sort of looking after me uh, was a young male Canadian, and he'd said at some stage that he was vegetarian. And I'd asked him, you know, why was he vegetarian? And it, it, what's interesting now is that uh, in many countries, there's a whole vocabulary that covers this. He said, what, was it, what did he say? The original gateway into vegetarian for me was the environment, and, but then I moved towards animal welfare, and, and he was sort of completely sort of comfortable with, with, with all this. A lot of people like this. And I said, why on earth, as a vegetarian, would you, like, you, know, would you want to buy a vegetable-based burger? something that looks like meat. I thought that was a clever question to ask. And he looked at me and said, well, everybody likes a burger. And I thought, right, you're right. He said, but I just don't want a meat burger. Everybody likes a burger with all that stuff you can put on it. You know, it's just a carrier for stuff, ketchup and the, and, and the likes. Do I think that's going to find its place? Absolutely. Uh, again, is it threatening? Well, to a degree. But, uh, but then the, the thing about meat is that in, where, in countries where people eat a lot of meat, Increasingly, they want to eat less, but when they eat, they want to eat better. And they'll pay more for better. That's the opportunity. And it just shows you've got the commodity end, the noun, beef, and then you've got the other end where with the adjectives. And so I look at products like corn, which we know in, uh, in, in Australia, which is owned by Monde Nissen out of the Philippines. Now, that would be the first billion dollar meatless meat. It will have its challenges because at the moment they can have packs saying meat-free chicken, which seems to me sort of stretching it a bit. Uh, meatless, soy-free chicken tenders. Well, yeah, right. But is it, are they good products? They're bloody good products. And these are, of course, it's a mycoprotein. Uh, you ferment it. Uh, has it got a long way to go? Hugely. I'll tell you something, Henry, that if you look at the, uh, the, the meat industry, if you look at EBITDAs, you know, earnings before in interest, tax, depreciation, and other stuff, then if you take a big company like JBS, notwithstanding its recent problems, that if they make like 4% EBITDA, then they have a party. 
Okay. Corn, year in, year out, makes 28% EBITDA. Do they sell this on price? No. This is not cheap. No. Is it profitable? Highly profitable. Uh, and so in my own market, if I take Tesco, this is Tesco on label. Uh, it's Wicked, uh, Wicked Kitchen uh, and Wicked Teriyaki noodles. So this is just like a meatless main course. Is it good food? It's very tasty. And it just makes the point, if you, in 1970, if you elected to be a vegetarian in most countries, then you were doomed. It was so, so that appalling, gritty soy burger or, or some really hideous nut loaf. And, and now there's just great food that happens not to have meat in it. It's, you know, just the job. Wicked carrot, pastrami, spice wrap, etc. Really nice. Uh, this I liked the other day. Here it is, insect and burger uh, coming out of, was it Austria or Germany? I can't remember. Uh, but do you think we'll be eating insects? You know, it's sort of fashionable to, to say yes, you know, cricket flour, et cetera, and particularly in Manhattan, you know, that you're, yes. And also remember in Asia, in many countries, and in history, they've been insect eaters. In Thailand, it, it's st uh, it, it, you take uh, f fried crickets with pepper, soy sauce, and a little bit of chili, say, and it would be a snack, particularly for students uh, when they're out drinking beer, et cetera. But I don't think, my line is, no. Nah. I think this is more indicative. Here's McDonald's champing research for insect feed for chickens, for fish. I'll tell you, you know, within 10 years, that will be pervasive. That it will be a high protein feed for intensively produced livestock, including fish. For certain. Absolutely. For certain. And why wouldn't it be? You know, look at the, uh, the efficiency. I mean, you don't, you know, a cricket, if you've got a, a, a mummy cricket, you don't have to wait nine months to get a baby. I mean, you know, she can produce about 10 zillion over a long weekend. <laughs> you know, so it's a brilliant. Uh, so it's, you know, that, uh, that, that's going to just revolutionize the industry, I would, uh, I would say, the intensive livestock. What else is pushing, it, this isn't all about me, what else, else is push, pushing against me? Look, there's a very well-organized, extraordinarily well-financed lobby that is bound and determined to change the diet of developed country consumers, where they're saying, if we carry on eating the level of meat that we are at the moment, if the emerging countries all end up like Australia, we're doomed. That's what they're saying. So if you take PETA, which you know really well, you remember Mulesing and, uh, uh, and Western Australia, I mean, in my market in Canada, in, in Dallas, I'm me, not meat. I'm me, not meat. They're, I mean, they're really into it. And if you see a PETA person or somebody who is on this platform, it's that sort of zeal in their eyes. You know, they, they're not about to want a discussion. No, they want their view imposed. Absolutely. I was telling the intensive egg guys the same. It's, uh, there we go. And so, but on, look, so meat under pressure to a degree, but let's not panic. But the consumer's view around the world of what is protein is just expanding. So it used to be protein meat. And then we thought, well, we might add fish. But now, you know, dairy products are sold on it, the basis that it's a protein. Now, it's plant-based protein. And so from a consumer perspective, there's a huge trend to increase protein content of the diet, but not of meat necessarily, and it's just extending it. So we're in sort of a wider world. And if you looked at the Impossible Burgers or the Beyond Meat that I showed you, who's investing in it? Cargill. Tyson, the major meat companies. They know what's coming, and you shouldn't view it as a great big threat. It's a great big opportunity, I tell you. It's just whacking opportunity. Uh, and, you know, here we are. A Mars, you know, Mars protein. Mars Snickers. It's about protein. For goodness sake. And what this does, I mean, part, it follows the trend, and it also removes guilt. You know. You, you, I'm going to have a Mars bar, really, should you? What about you? Know, that's a, I want the protein. Oh, okay, that's all right. <laughs> Mars protein, yeah. This is October 1st, 2018, yeah. Here we go. Uh, other, look, snackified, if that's the right word, eating. That if you went back to the 1970s, no, 1990s, that uh, you'd say, Mum, what's for dinner? That would be the cry. Mum, what's for dinner? 
And mum would proudly say, um, not anti-beef, by the way, mum would proudly say, it's beef. And the family would go, ah, it's beef. Uh, now, if you say to a, a millennial, and, and look, what's for dinner? They're more likely to say, what's dinner? You know, we don't have dinner. And so that three meals a day sort of breaks down into a series of mini meals or snacks. And snacks don't have to be profoundly unhealthy. They can be very healthy snacks, very healthy mini, mini meals. And I'd say, I mean, this is hugely important. I know you know about this, but just look at your product portfolio. And to, uh, is it snackable? If it's not, you've got to get snacking or else you're missing on half the damn market. Uh, what do we say here? 33% of morning snacks are consumed. Yeah, 91% of consumer snack no, goes on. It's 50% of all eating occasions are now snacks in the US. All right. It's, uh, and and I, I do a lot of work in fresh produce, uh, so in fruit and veggies. I had my own fruit, uh, uh, my own fresh, fresh produce company uh, in the US for years. Uh, but now I'm looking at his PepsiCo, one of the great snack companies of the world. Uh, just buying this year uh, Bear Foods, and what it is, it's a like veggie snack maker, Bear Foods. Where does this go? It sort of pops into lunch boxes, and it's seen as being equivalent to fresh produce. And so I tell the fresh produce industry, they're taking your clothes. They're taking clothes. That's why across most high developed countries, fruit consumption, fresh fruit consumption isn't increasing. This consumption is increasing. And I say, beware of a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's PepsiCo. You know, they're stealing your clothes one way or another. Uh, I was in Bunbury's Farmer's Market uh, yesterday afternoon talking to the lovely Graham, uh, the passionate Graham, and uh, just looking at what their offer was. And, you know, he's, are they on trend down there in Bunbury? Yeah, they are. I, you bet your life they are. Our cold press juices, it's drink up your fruit and veggies. You know, we never thought of drinking up our veggies, but now it is. You know, you're not going to bother. You know. Kale? Do you really want to eat kale? What is it about kale? You know, I mean, I, somebody my age, when I was 10, uh, in the summer holidays, I used to work on a dairy farm. and used to feed the cows kale. And then the cows went off kale. Uh, and, and then in the 70s, in the flower power area, if you remember, in, particularly in California, kale came back as a, a mild sexual flagellant. <laughs> uh, you know, but that was faddish, really, didn't catch on. And now suddenly, I mean, you can't hold your head up in polite society if you're not sort of whacking into kale and, uh, with chia. Uh, you know, what's that? But our cold-pressed juices, yeah. 100% carrot, lemon, ginger, and, orange. and you know, look how you know, good old Bunbury Farmers Market is. You know, they're, are they on trend? 100% vegan, 100% raw for the paleos, 100% homemade, etc. Right, it's not made by big food. All that is bang on trend. God, you know, God love them. That's what I say. God love them. Uh, but it doesn't matter where you look. Here we are. There's a huge increase in jerky, uh, demand for jerky or whatever it's called. What do we call it here? Jerky, yeah. Uh, premium meats not attracting beefy investments, uh, chili beef, uh, Moroccan lamb, piri piri chicken, Thai turkey, snack bars, snack bars. I can quickly tell a tale because I think I've got, got time. I was talking um, in uh, the middle of the U.S. in the high country in Big Sky, Montana, a year ago actually now, uh, at the World Buffalo Congress. There you go. Do I need to get out more? Probably not. There we go. But it, it, it was lovely. Wife came. It was, it was, it was great. I had a great time. And uh, so I, the opening speak, and I was followed by two people, who, uh, two young people who were 32, 32 year olds, and they were, were, they had been or were triathletes, and they'd um, struggled to find protein that they could have on the run and snack, and so they developed something which they call, uh, Google it when you can, the Epic Bar, E-P-I-C, the Epic Bar. And the Epic Bar was buffalo jerky, or bison jerky as the Americans would say, with bacon, everybody likes bacon, and cranberries and spices, and put it into, into a bar. And that was in 2015. 
and they did well. They were, let's say, two real youngies. Uh, and by 2017, they'd got sales to 20 million US. That's bloody good. And General Mills, one of the biggest food companies in the world, came up and said, would you accept 100 mil for this? In two years, from a startup, they sold it for 100 million. And it's continued to do well. The two of them are still involved with the business, and I've heard them s since, but now it's, it, it's sort of, they're very zen, these two, as you might expect. <laughs> uh, and, and it's a, hey, you know, it's, it's not about the money. <laughs> it's about the buffalo. <laughs> but do they know how to tell a story? You bloody bet they know how to tell a story. And it was really, really interesting, because in, in that wee story, they said, yeah, we've always been a little unusual, there was the two of us, and our first full-time employee was a pack designer. And if you look at the Epic Bar pack, you think, wow. Whew. Or, if, as I did, if you look at their little stand that they put into every uh, food industry exhibition, etc., you thought, wow, wow. You know, it wasn't a food technologist. It wasn't a market. It was a pack designer. It was bloody good. It was really, really good. More of the same, but you know, if you want a mini meal or a snack, is there anything more international than sushi? I don't think so. It doesn't matter where I go. It's there. You know, in some time in the middle, well, I'll just say in Siem Reap in Cambodia, if you have the nerve, you can buy sushi downtown. I'm thinking, what is their supply chain like? Dear Lord, what? <laughs> but you know, it's everywhere. Uh, that was, I was using it with the egg guys, saying, what's the egg industry snacking response? Uh, because, but this, it's sort of old time. You can't, Kraft Heinz can't get away from this because they are what they are, big food from the, uh, from the 20th century, not the 21st century. And this is, they, they've got like a, uh, a cardboard cup with fixings in, and then you crack uh, 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 an egg in, and uh, 30 seconds in the microwave, and it gives you sort of scrambled eggs that you can eat in the office. Actually, it's not bad. It isn't bad. But so... Uh, so, so those snacks, really, really important. But then this, it doesn't matter if you're in Australia, it doesn't matter if you're in Singapore, it doesn't matter if you're in Hangzhou or where you are, it's you know, households, families are just running out of time, like you guys are. I mean, you know, that appalling period in the day between four and six where if there are two parents, let's say there's an old-fashioned family with children and two parents, that, you know, where the two parents negotiate with each other about... Who's, what we're going to have, who's going to make it, who's going to buy it, etc. You know, it's awful. Uh, it's that time starvation. So, uh, you know, and so you can see the journey that you, we're on. You, you, say you, you start off by convenience foods where, it's, you know, where the beans have been pre-chopped or whatever, and then you move slowly towards a, uh, a ready meal. I mean, in the UK, we're sort of big on ready meals, but not that big. But, you know, but look, at the, look at the value here, for goodness sake. So Waitrose is a premium retailer in the UK. It's only got about 5% grocery market share. It appeals to a certain demographic. Older, richer, brilliant, that's me. <laughs> and so I'll pop down on a Friday night, as I did uh, in August, whenever it was. And so what did I buy? Uh, you get a Bloody Mary prawn cocktail, which is uh, endorsed by Heston Blumenthal. The, sort of the celebrity chef. Main course, chicken breast with asparagus and prosciutto uh, with parmentier potatoes. And then you have the option of, in this particular case, four Peroni beers uh, or a bottle of either red or white wine, and quite good red or white wine, for 18 Oz. Is that a good deal? That's a bloody good deal. That's a good deal. I, I, actually, I normally choose the wine because I'm a wine drinker. But in this particular case, I, I, I got the four beers because my wife doesn't like beer. <laughs> so, you know, that's that move towards, that, that, that sort of move to ready meals, you see. It. But it's the same everywhere you go. Uh, yesterday, uh, as you guys, you're wonderful at uh, putting everything to either ending in I, E, or O. You know, I was at the servo between Bunbury and Perth, and it's, it's my meal deal. Pick any main, add drink, add any snack, save 30%. Why do I put that up? It's because if you're looking at your domestic market or my market, if you want to be in the, you know, you're going to say, do I want to be in the meal deal? Is my product meal deal friendly? 
And so, you know, how do I get it into that meal deal? Back to, uh, just out of interest, if you went back here, Marks and Spencers, for example, uh, I mean, who are brilliant at uh, ready meals, but they'll do, as the others do, but Marks and Spencers best, they do a Valentine's Day ready meal uh, package, and they, they, the price is 20 pounds. And for that, you, you, you get a starter, uh, a main course, two sides, a dessert, chocolates, heart-shaped, and a bottle of fizzy for 20 pounds. And uh, when I looked, when I talked to them, I said, well, what sort of sale do you get on that? This, this last year, they sold 700,000. And then I talked to the suppliers and said, do you make any money at that? It must be. And they said, well, no, it's pretty, the margin is pretty thin, but it covers our cost problems for six months. We get so much getting through that plant that we cover off all sorts of things, and then we make our margin on doing special things. So, you know, it, it's, it, it can be a big deal. So, you know, how do you get into the meal deal? Because increasingly, wherever I go in the, the UK, we only buy stuff on a meal deal. It's lunch. And, and the nice thing is, increase, now you see premium meal deals. You know, so, do you want the, you know, the poor peoples? In the, in, in the UK, it would be, let's say it was two to one in your dollar. It's not quite that. But it would be, like, do you want the $7 meal deal? Or do you want the $10 one, and, you know, $12. So, you know, we're starting to see premiumization of that brilliant opportunity. Uh, and again, just because I was at Bunbury, uh, I, I, why I put this in is because, look, you don't have to be a big Marks and Spencer's supplier to do this. I mean, these guys are doing it in their back kitchen in Bunbury. Uh, but, you know, here we were at, at seven bucks and, you know, some slices of cheese. Just made an effort to, to order, you know, we can all do this if we want to. They're into ready meals one way or another without the stainless steel, I would suggest. Uh, okay, more consumer trends. This focus on health and product origin, uh, which is so important right around the world, and it gives you an opportunity. I love this. If I put up the OECD obesity league table for 2016, you might be a little disappointed, but you're not in the medal positions, but you're right up there. So there's the US and Mexico. You'd be perhaps surprised to see that New Zealand it comes third. Yeah, can you imagine that? I, I was show, again, showing this in New Zealand, and I, I said, you were in the bronze medal position. There was a guy in the front who said, yeah, we never win anything. <laughs> yeah, apart from rugby. So, so yeah, uh, although, you know, what, I always, what always completely bemuses me is, <laughs> is that Aussies and New Zealanders are seen around the world as, as, as being so often blonde-haired, slightly tanned, uh, athletic, leap over buildings, etc. Uh, people, and you know, and, and often told it's because of the wonderful food they've got, and so that's the perception they've got, which is all through your backpackers. And the fact of the matter is, you're all as round as puddings. You, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. But but look how food culture uh, affects this. It's fascinating that Italy, ten percent clinically obese, versus Australia. 30%. It's about food culture. In Italy, when I'm working at the university, uh, when I'm, sorry, if I'm talking at a university in, in Italy, the, the students there at lunchtime all go to their restaurant or, you know, canteen as we used to call it, and they have a little starter, a little main course, a dessert, a cup of coffee, and they sit down together for an hour and, say, well, and they say, well, it's lunchtime. I mean, does that happen in Curtin? No, or in the UK, it's pizza on your lap with your laptop. That's what it is. I think that's got a lot to do with this, sort of, but that's by the by, that mustn't go on. And, but what's happening, if I look around the world, I'm saying, remember I started talking about it, that governments are now saying, we have to do something radical to change what people eat. Here's Belgium saying, essentially, don't eat any of these, which is bacon, any processed meat, uh, French fries, pizza, chips, uh, wine, for God's sake. Eat less of butter, red meat. Eat more of, actually, eggs, some cheeses, fish, and uh, fruit and veggies. You know, there. And, you know, it happens around the world, apart from the U.S. Uh, uh, I say I had my business in the U.S. for 15 years, and my partner and I used to go to 
I hop every Sunday. Uh, for, we worked our backsides off setting up the business, and the Sunday we just, that was breakfast. I, do, I hop International House of Pancakes. And I saw this, it was at the beginning of the all you can eat pancakes for, only in the US when you see this slather poor, eat, repeat. <laughs> You know, this would be against the law in lots of countries, I, I, I can assure you. And, and, and again, for, for you, does that mean you can't have naughty things? Now, I like this from A.T. Kearney, only eat bad things that are good. So, you know, if you've got things which are slightly naughty, then pop in an ingredient that's good, because it removes the guilt. Uh, uh, so, premium cookies made with superfoods. You see what I mean? It's, uh, uh, so, you know, you can... You can remove that guilt, just uh, all you, and if, so if it's chocolate, then remind them that it's the antioxidants, you know, that's why you're eating it. It's, uh, it's, uh, and I, uh, when we stopped at, uh, at the servo, I just picked off, what were they selling there? Table of plenty, here we are. You can, you can see how they picked up the trends. Mini rice crackers, uh, it's uh, whole grain, fructose friendly, whatever that means, gluten free, vegan friendly, all natural. Only 16 calories, it's chocolate, uh, but antioxidants, it's dark chocolate, which is the, the good chocolate. And I think, you know, that's, that's a great little snack. The only worry I have, it comes from Holland. So isn't that disappointing? Isn't that bloody disappointing? Ticking the uh, So there we go. So this, and you can see the pressure that Coles, Woolies, etc., are going to be put under government saying, change the shopping habits if you can. And I think as we move forward that food products will be tailored to personal priorities. That people for, in higher income countries, they'll say, now, what am I trying to do here? Am I trying to be physically fit, energetic, active, uh, feeling good about myself, which is sort of beauty perhaps, leading a balanced, more sort of zen lifestyle, or not being ill, I've got a problem here. And then you decide, okay, depending which track I'm on here, what am I going to eat? And there'll just be more and more of that, I would suggest. Look where you fit into the great scheme of things. And expect to see government go in with a big stick. So if, if you've got a product which is, involves fat, sugar, or salt, or indeed alcohol, then watch it, because you're probably about to be regulated. They will come in, and they will regulate. That salt tax, fat tax, it will come. They'll have to do it, because the cost of diabetic, particularly disease, is so high. Heart disease for the salt, of course. So the number one global mega consumer trend, for my mind, is the notion of consumers making mindful choices. So what's a mindful choice? I want food, remember we put it in our mouth, that is affordable and tasty, and hopefully a little bit convenient, but I want it to be healthy for me, my family, for the environment, for the local economy, for the animals, for the workers in the industry, etc. You know, that's really important. And you can see it writ large here, uh, taking the Mintel Global New Product Database, which is, they, they sort of track everything that they can get right around the world. If you went back 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 1% of all new products made some sort of ethical or environmental claim. Now it's about a quarter. It's become the norm increasingly. And sometimes you get things that sort of you know, swing. I, I, actually, I mean, this is the Attenborough guy. I don't know if you remember or saw Blue Planet 2, which was enormously influential. But actually in Australia, and so now what's happening, just look at your packaging. Because increasingly people are buying on packaging, too. That becomes one of the attributes. You know, so, for example, in my household, my wife won't buy certain things if it's not recyclable or compostable. She said, I'm outraged. And, so, and, and it's the domino theory. I say, what happens, the food industry around the world has said, we'll change, and by 2025, all our packaging will be recyclable. You won't have that time. You'll be pushed into that well before. And there'll be movements. We won't buy your product. People are outraged increasingly. Uh, in Thailand, for goodness sake, they're not using, uh, they're starting to, uh, tops 
that excellent chain, and moving towards not using plastic bags. Uh, so and you, Starbucks and McDonald's joining together to save the planet, to ditch plastic straws. And, and you know this thing has got legs when you see, here we are, Bulldog, skin care for men. Here you go. It's not wussy for men to be concerned about their skin now. And what it is, you're right, sugarcane plastic tubes are a step in the right direction. At the top, they're saying a principal reason for buying us is the packaging is you know, compostable or recyclable. This is real. You know, it's happening, and it will affect your businesses. In the UK, Walkers is owned by PepsiCo, and they dominate the uh, potato chips business. Who dominates in Australia? PepsiCo. Who owns Smith's? PepsiCo. You know, so, but in the UK, what they found was that Walkers, which it's Lay's in the US and in many markets, but it's Walkers in the, in the UK. The Walkers chip bag has a half-life of plutonium-329. And you know, like 30 years later, they're still there, hanging around. And people have said, that, that, that's irresponsible. And what they're doing is posting them back to Walkers. <laughs> and, and the post office said, could you stop for the moment, because we can't handle that with our automated equipment, and we've got to bring in extra staff. <laughs> but Walkers, of course, have got the story. They know that's, that's just not on. They can't do that. It's gone. And food waste, also a big issue too. But, so what I'm saying, but it's not just about you know, its health. It's, I, I think this whole business of using food for how I look is starting to get genuine legs, uh, particularly with younger shoppers. And for goodness sake, like beauty foods have always been a big deal in Japan and uh, South Korea. And it, now we're just seeing more and more of them. Uh, uh, so, you know, this sort of collagen-based stuff, for example, here I am uh, in uh, Malaysia, but uh, off we go. So, uh, just give me two minutes and I'll be done. And so, what's all this about? The increasing, uh, come back to this, consumers are wanting to say, what's in it? Where did the ingredients come from? What are the ingredients? And it's, this one's ideal, ingredients you can see and pronounce. So it's about transparency and traceability through the supply chain. I think, actually, that's brilliant news for, uh, for producers, for farmers. Because what they're saying is, actually, who produced this and how did they do it? Were they a real farmer or a factory farmer or a nasty farmer? And, you know, that's right round. So here's Kind with the... Uh, and so yesterday, again, I was just looking at... Uh, the, the Australian... Good Australian... You know, that artisanal... The, uh, this is on the premium end. People want the artisan, you know, somebody with some skills, not general foods. Uh, here are the, you can see the adjectives. It's not salt, it's sea salt. It's uh, absolutely nothing artificial, etc. We, we didn't used to bother much about the ingredients. That was somebody else's business. Now, and you've got to be completely open. Here's Kellogg's who bought RX Bella to try and rejuvenate their product portfolio. And RX Bar sells on the basis of this simple ingredients. What's in here? It's the blueberry version of three eggs, egg whites, six almonds, four cashews, two dates, no bullshit. That's, that is their package. And very proud of it. And then suddenly a special interest group says, actually, the blueberries are dried blueberries infused with apple juice concentrate. And the egg whites are egg white protein powder. You know, if you're going to tell us what's in the ingredients, tell us what's in the ingredients. Be completely open about it. Uh, and, you know, that really whacked them. And so I was working with the, the egg guys. I, I was saying to them, you know, particularly for, like, primary producers here, whether in meat, egg, dairy, or et cetera, you've got a real opportunity here, which is if you take eggs. On every egg box, I put ingredients. Eggs. That's what's in here. The eggs, not a list. I mean, think of the number of processed food products you can pick up and look at the ingredients. And in many cases, I've read shorter books. You know, there's that much. What? So, you know, you've got op if, if you've got simple products here, and that's what people want, then you've got an opportunity to celebrate the naturalness and the nutrition of your products. 
People want to know where does it come from, what's its story, who produced it, how they produced it, etc. And I think you've got something to say. Uh, and in history, uh, we sort of suppressed that, didn't talk about it. You can see you know, th this, th the notion of, of blockchain, for example, which is just really looking down the supply chain and see, so, so that we can see where did it come from, what happened to it as it came along. And it's uh, blockchain, which really was introduced, let's say, two years ago, is now just becoming pervasive when you can see the Walmarts, the Carrefours of this world, these great international retailers, uh, saying, you know, we have to have this as part and parcel of the, uh, the supply chains into our business. You know how important it is. So where are we? And, and, and actually, you know, without sort of getting soft, etc. but I mean, what I notice around the, the world, uh, and but sticking in the, the, the food world, is this, the whole business of turning business on its head, that big food has taken such a bloody thumping where big food has been seen part of the problem, not part of the solution. And the leaders, like Paul Polman from Unilever, said, we have to sort of just take another look at our business model. And we've got to start with society and consumers and then satisfy their requirements and then see how we can make money out of that, rather than saying, let's make money and then try and sort of fix the rest as we go along. Uh, so, and what do Unilever find? That their sustainable brands, the ones they're really working on, actually grow faster and make more money. Danone, one of the you know, great dairy companies of the world too, they're now moving towards being a B Corp, uh, which is you know, ex the sort of uh, the Unilever approach, which is put society first. And that, that, I don't think that's sort of greenwash at all now. I think it's just changing the way that we do business. You can see that with the sort of products that Unilever launching. This is the first uh, personal care brand in 20 years coming out of Unilever. And what is it? Love, beauty, and planet. And they know it can't be greenwashed because there's every special interest group with a hot poker saying, if you make bloody promises here and don't deliver, then we'll just burn you. you know, so it's... Uh, so, uh, and what I know, it's sustainable development goals, for example, UN, that uh, there used to be, well, that's something the UN does. I think increasingly we have to look at those and say, to what extent do we relate to it? Uh, and so, th this is the, the, the only way I get so slightly academic. But I, remember 101 marketing? There was the, uh, the marketing five Ps. It was the four Ps, then it became five Ps. It's, you've got to have the right product at the right price, at the right place where you sell it with the right promotion, with the right people backing it. Well, increasingly, particularly that younger group is saying, we need another set of five Ps. And they are purpose, that they want to deal with companies that they feel comfortable with. Do you share my values as a consumer? I've got a set of values. I want to work with people who share those values. Uh, I want to feel pride with, I buy from, and I feel proud of that. Uh, I want a partnership with those that, with, with the, the food companies that I, uh, that, that I use. Uh, I want to feel safe about, secure when doing business with your company. And then increasingly we want that sort of element of personalization where, you know, ha have you taken my specific interests in place? Actually, un not unrelated to this, but I was the, the, the other day, I was, uh, I spent the morning in Harrods in, in London in their food halls, which is always worth a visit. And I spent the morning with their marketing director. And they were just opening their baking section. And it was a sort of a wonderful way of adding value in their new baking section. Sourdough, which is sort of very fashionable. You can buy a sourdough loaf in Harrods for as little as $15. But if you want to pay slightly more, you can, which is you book it in advance and they put your initials in it. I thought that was lovely. So it'd be so DH, you know, David Hughes. And then you can pick up your own sourdough loaf and it has pride of place. I thought, what a nice way of personalizing and making you know, an extra buck, for goodness sake. But you know, what a change in, in, in our world. Uh, last, was it this year or last? I can't remember. I was in Lille in France uh, talking at the Global Soy Roundtable Conference, which is where they were looking for the, those producing soy and using soy get together. Uh, and who was there? The panda was there. You know, we know the panda, WWF, World Wildlife Fund. Don't mess with the panda. That's all I'll tell you, because she's got a bloody big stick, and she's about to batter you if she believes that you're doing things which are naughty. 
And so what, you know, here's their ad saying, we've got our soy sco scorecard. We will score all the fast food firms, all the food processors on where and how they source soy. So do you really know what's behind the meat, eggs, and cheese you eat? So essentially, just think. Now, if you're KFC anywhere in the world, what they're saying is, what were the chickens? They were fed soy. Where did that soy come from, and how was it farmed? We want to know that. And if there's a problem, we will tell the world. So those great big, the KFCs of this world, the McDonald's of this world, their brand, if you will, is at risk if they are procuring, if they haven't got integrity in, in their, their procurement. And now, why is that good news for you? Because I don't think you've got much to hide. And I think you've got a bloody good story to tell. You're not destroying the Amazon. And so what, what we're seeing here is these sort of social pressures which dictate choice. It's sort of interesting. I, I say to, to myself, remind me again what I can't eat. You know, uh, right, it's got palm oil in, bugger. Uh, is that, does it come from Borneo? You know, what about the orangutans, or however you pronounce it? Chicken, has it been fed from soy? Well, it's been fed soy. Does it come from Brazil? Well, where in Brazil? Shrimps, uh, Air New Zealand uh, won't, ser won't serve shrimps from Thailand because of slave, uh, slave problems on the boats. Uh, the beef, did it destroy the Amazon if it comes from Brazil? Anything, with, you know, anything on a non-recyclable pack, you can see it sort of, coming at a rate of knots. I mean, I, what, I missed a little sort of side story that uh, I'm Welsh, proud of it, uh, not English. And uh, Wales was ahead of the game in the UK about uh, putting a price on plastic bags in supermarkets. Okay, so it's, for years now, you pay 5p if you have to have a bag. And the use of supermarket plastic bags decreased by 95% in three months. Now, what was that to do with? Was it to do with 5p a bag? Nah. No, it was to do with social pressure. And I can tell you because I, I, I try to do some of the shopping. And you know, if you're in a line, I mean, if the lady in front of you has to buy a bag, invariably she'll apologize to the queue. To, I, I normally bring my own bag, terribly sorry, and she's, she's guilty. It's not to do with 5p. 5p's bugger all, to be honest. So it's uh, recyclability, it's, 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 it's a big deal, moving on. Okay, now quickly, because I don't have much time left, I just want what I think is happening globally in like retailing and, and what have you. And this is figures that don't often use them. This is compound annual growth rate in revenues over this period for 15 principal grocery players. This is not, an, a, a, this is not Woolworths and Coles, but it's, you know, it's like a worldview. And I've taken e-commerce giants, which means Alibaba, uh, it means Amazon, and it means Tencent. So the two uh, discounters, which is Aldi particularly, but also Lidl, etc. Drug and Club, so pharmacies, etc. Mass grocers, which are the big supermarkets like Walmart, Carrefour, Kroger, Auchan, etc. Uh, and what else have I got? And that's it. Okay. And what does it show that over a five-year period that those big guys, the e-commerce giants, have been growing at 34% compound? Uh, discounters at close to 6%. Drug and club at 4%, like Costco, etc. Mass grocers, barely growing. I can tell you in the UK that Tesco, uh, who have improved enormously, but they're trying to shrink their stores. They're trying to find people, businesses, that will take space in their hypermarkets because there's just less, they're selling less because they're going through other routes, I'll tell you. And so what about discounters in Europe? Every year it grows. I mean, what is it in, uh, in Australia? It's something like 12%. Aldi from nothing. And now taking, let's say, 11% grocery market share in, in Australia. Will they take more? You bet your life they will. They'll take more. In the UK, it's 12%. Will they take more? Yes, they'll take more. Uh, here's Tesco saying, what, what can we do? They've just opened their own di hard discount chain called Jack's. Uh, that's by the by. When I'm in the U.S. and I follow the U.S. system pretty well, it's carnage. The big retailers, like the Walmarts, etc., are doing well. I'll come back to that. But the regional retailers are just getting their backsides tanned. Yeah, it's carnage. Uh, who's good at, uh, at e-commerce? Well, Australian, no. Uh, the U.S., no. 
but it's you know, about South Korea, to some extent in the UK, we're quite good at it, but China and it's growing so, so quickly. And it's just a lovely quick story, I was working in South Africa about four weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, and as I was traveling around, one of my talking companions was a, 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 a lady from Shanghai called Mabel, who has her own marketing communications uh, company, and I was on the bus with her, and she kept uh, telling me about her family, et cetera, that was, it was lovely, and she said, my husband's very timid. I didn't quite know what she meant. He's a very timid man. And, and so she's talking, they said, ding, ding, it's her husband. She says, it's my husband. And then she looks at me and says, he's run out of fruit and vegetables. He's in Shanghai. He's a very timid man. He's run out. Of, okay. And she said, uh, okay, okay, love. And she said to me, excuse me a minute. On her other phone, she orders fruit and vegetables for him. And before she finished talking to him, 20 minutes later, they'd been delivered. He had to get off the phone to go and get the, the fruit and veg which was just being delivered. You know, do they know how to do that? Well, yes, they do. Yes, they do. So who's leading the way? It's, it's, it, go to South Korea, go to, to, to China. And then, you know, we had this sort of whole food market which is bought by Amazon and then suddenly we realize it's not just about online. It's about omnichannel. And the, the sort of the winning retailer, if we go forward, will be the retailer who is best at online hypermarket, regular supermarket, metro stores, uh, convenience, etc. And for you guys, what does that mean? You've got to look at each of those routes to the consumer and say, which product format fits which route to the consumer? Because it's different. What you buy in a convenience store isn't what you buy in a great big club, whatever it may be. So it's, uh, and you know, was Amazon, was that unusual? No, Jack Ma, the Alibaba head who's just, uh, just, uh, retired, God love him, uh, and Tencent are doing exactly the same. They're buying bricks and mortar. Uh, and, and look at this. It actually, this, I just quickly looked at the market cap, market capitalization of some major growth. Amazon, actually, it was close to a trillion. It's come down 100 billion in the last month. But, you know, so it's a little bit volatile. Alibaba and Tencent at, you know, at mid 300s. Here's Walmart, you know, this great monolith comes in at number four, uh, Woolies. Woolies is a big retailer by any measure, but it's you know, 30 billion. Tesco, less. Carrefour, 15 billion. Now what, the, you know, you can see what resources they've got. You know, when they pay, when he paid whatever it was, 10 billion for, uh, for Whole Foods, that, that's loose change, that's loose change. And how is that affected? You know, the, these Amazons, the Alibabas, the Tencent, the JD.coms of this world. What, what impact has that had on big retailers? They're panicked and for bloody good reason. And so in my market, Asda, which was Walmart, has merged with Sainsbury's. So we've got to do that to get ourselves in a position that we compete with the discounters and with Alibaba. Uh, it's, let's move on. Here we go. Ahol Delhaize. They were Ahol from, uh, from the Netherlands, Delhaize from... Uh, Belgium, which were both very successful in the U.S., they've just merged. They said, we've got to be bigger if we've got to handle Alibaba. Uh, what about Tesco uh, and Carrefour? No, they haven't merged, but they've said, we will buy together now. If, if, if there's a supply who sells to both, then we'll buy together. That's to give us more bargaining power. That is not necessarily great news from a supplier point of view. It means you're going to be under more pressure, but if you can take that pressure, then you've just got a huge market. Uh, what about in the US itself? I mean, what's amazed me is how the big players have responded. Target, Costco, and Walmart have all had their best year in years. And what have they done? They've gone out and got themselves an electronic platform. They're doing things in uh, home delivery. It's, you know, they, you, when the tough, when, say, when the going gets tough, the tough do get going, or else they just fall right off their perches. I would suggest. Uh, I see it with Kroger. Kroger have done a deal with uh, the UK's Ocado, which is to give them a home delivery option. They've got a meal kit company they've just bought. Uh, Instacart does their delivery. Uh, what else have they done? They've got a uh, driverless delivery test, etc. Et you know, you can't sit and get steamrolled. You've got to do something, and they are. It's really so fascinating. 
But really, if you want to see the future, you know, go to China and just see, uh, you know, for example, here's Jack Ma again in Hema, which is uh, the one of his uh, 21st century supermarkets, if you will, where you can you can go there and shop. You can go there and have the, uh, or you can order online, you can eat there, you can pick your seafood and then have it uh, uh, sent home, or you can eat it in, in store, etc. It's, it's a brilliant. It's, uh, and here we are, Auchan, the French retailer, uh, with one, it's several hundred cashier. I mean, it's a box. You pop in there, it will have like 600 SKUs, 600 products. There's nobody in there. You just pick what you want, pay, and then out you go. You know, you can see things are changing. It's just brilliant. So it's about omnichannel. And it's putting all these together. But it's, I think, fundamental and it's profound for, for suppliers. They've got to know what's my best product for hypermarkets versus convenience versus et cetera, et cetera. And look, uh, I, I do a little blog every uh, month if I can. I haven't done one for a month because I got too busy. But, uh, but we've got Alexa at home. How many people have Alexa here? You know the Alexa, you know what it is, you know? Yeah, yeah. okay, so we've got it in the kitchen, and you, uh, I mean, I, I'm a bit iffy with Alexa, because she can be supercilious, you know? You've got to watch her like a hawk. But I'll, in the morning, I'll ask her what the weather's going to be like, but my, my wife will say, Alexa, add uh, paper towels to the basket. And then, you know, she just sort of builds the shopping list, and then when she's about ready, she says, Alexa, deliver groceries. And then they sort of arrive, they just sort of arrive. Uh, but what do I think is going to happen in five years' time? Going to the center of a supermarket, aisles 12, no, 8 to 14. What do they call that part of the supermarket in the U.S.? The morgue. The morgue. Where the dead bodies are. What's sold there? Shelf-stable products, things that you buy on a regular basis that you're not particularly emotionally attached to. I see, you know, Pet food, carbonated beverages, paper goods, etc., detergents, where well, you buy the same thing, you're not going to buy those in supermarkets. They're just going to arrive at your house when you want them. They'll know at a good price. And so what are you going to do with all that space? Well, actually, it's good news for fresh food because that's what they want. People want the theater. They want to go there and, wow, brilliant. They don't want to be in the morgue the frozen food aisle. And I, sweetheart, we've missed the frozen food aisle. And she didn't stop. She didn't think about what she was saying. She just quickly said to me, we don't need peas. Because <laughs> that's the only thing she buys frozen. And I thought, that's bloody hard luck if you're in the frozen food business from the Hughes family, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't say, if you're going to improve our display, maybe they'd get more. Well, not if we'd never go down your aisle. So, you know, that's just a fact. It's... Uh, so, so that middle of the aisle, it's gone. Turn the lights off, I would suggest. Uh, and then, what's fabulous is we've seen this, you can see how tough it is for, uh, for, for supermarkets. Because remember, there's only so much food we're going to eat. But increasingly, food service and food retail have converged. I mean, I think they're the same. And in history, in a, in a company, you'd had the food retail division and the food service division. Well, now, you know, if I go around Marks and Spencer's, for example, there are ready meals, and then there are restaurants. Well, hang on, what's the, what's the difference here? And so you get restaurant delivery services are now a growing challenge for, for supermarkets. And so things like, what, what do we have in, uh, in Perth? Deliveroo? Yes. yes. Uh, Uber Eats, yes. I mean, these are US, really, Just Eat, Grubhub, Delivery Hero, et cetera. Uh, let's take Uber Eats, for example. This is last week in London. Uber Eats, buy one meal, get another free. What? I mean, do you think supermarkets say, brilliant, thank you very much, Uber Eats. That's just taking sales from them. And uh, here we are with, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of wonderful. I'm rather proud of Steve Easterbrook, who is the CEO of McDonald's globally, because he happens to be a POM. Uh, but uh, what was funny, McDonald's said, globally, one billion customers live within five to ten minutes of McDonald's. And their interpretation of that was, brilliant. It isn't far for them to come to us. And then Easterbrook said, excuse me, it's not far for us to go to them in terms of delivery. And so, you know, it's now they have that Uber Eats connection 
with, um, uh, with, with McDonald's. And here we are. Here's Deliveroo in London. Okay. Uh, everybody thinks Deliveroo is Australian because of the kangaroo. In China, they think it's uh, uh, Chinese. You know, everybody thinks Deliveroo is from their own country. Actually, it doesn't matter where it's from, but I think it's actually UK. But so you've got Deliveroo in... They're so successful in London in terms of delivering the meals produced by independent restaurants to businesses and to homes that those independent restaurants have run out of kitchen space. And so Deliveroo said, in which case you can rent space from us, lease space from us in large warehouses where we will replicate your kitchen and where you can use that space for the online. So you've got these wonderful independent restaurants that they've managed to say, double their trade, but they couldn't do it within their own restaurant. They just ran out of space. You know, brilliant. But then every meal you get from that is say it's less you buy from a supermarket. Uh, of course, we've got meal kits, etc. Uh, and whether that works, what about meal kits here? Do they work? Yeah? I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of tough in the US. They, they started off, it was an online thing. Now most supermarkets sell meal kits. So it's a combination of, of, of both. But as you can see, you know, it's, uh, it's just moving on. There are so many routes to the consumer. So if you take, uh, oh, I've just forgotten the name. It's, somebody will tell me, apart from HelloFresh, what's the, uh, just forgotten the number two meal kit company. It's got purple in its name. Uh, in, in, in the U.S., so this, the number two meal kit company. Uh, so is it worthwhile f tracking that? Again, I was working with a meat company in uh, Christchurch, Ansco, actually, uh, and uh, its biggest customer in the U.S. Uh, was Blue Apron, was, was the number two um, meal kit company for lamb. You know, that didn't exist as a route to the consumer three, four years ago. And then people say, yeah, it's only a niche. Well, it's not for Ansco. That's their biggest customer, <coughs> for goodness sake. Purple carrot. Purple carrot. And there's Blue Apron. Look, yeah, that's the thing. The purple carrot. <laughs> and here we are. Here's Danone, who's just dropped, what, 30 million, it's n nothing, really, uh, into a salad vending machine in the US. And that's doing pretty well. It's doing pretty well. You know, the whole thought of what, salads out of vending machine? It's going well. It's going well. Once, it's about trust. Once consumers, once prospective customers work out, there's a lot of volume here, and it really turns, then, you know, this salad wasn't made last Thursday. So it's... Uh, oh. and, but, uh, and the other thing, look, in most countries, certainly in the UK, food to go is the fastest growing part of the food industry. And in general, supermarkets don't do food to go as well as specialty people who do food to go. Now, a lot of you will know the UK. If you take Pret-a-Manger, which has just been bought by Jab Holdings out of, it's a private firm out of Germany for, you know, for a couple of billion. Uh, they're brilliant at it. Just really good. So, uh, uh, and when you're looking at your, uh, your own customer portfolio, saying, what food to go customers have we got or haven't we got? Here's Starbucks. Globally, Starbucks have said, we're going to double our food sales by 2020. I mean, 2020, like, that's in 18 months' time. Yeah. And look how the logo of Starbucks has evolved. I know Starbucks doesn't do well here because you're, you're sort of wonderfully Australian about it. If it's not Gloria Jean's, just sulk. It's, it's, it's moved from Starbucks, Starbucks coffee, to, to now the logo, don't mention coffee, I mean, of course, it's about coffee, but it's about a lot more than that. I'll see you at Starbucks for breakfast. I'll see you at Starbucks for lunch. You know, is that a customer? That's a big customer. In China, there's a Starbucks open. I mean, I might get it wrong by 40 minutes. I think there's a Starbucks opens every 20 minutes. You know, that's the sort of brilliant thing about China is when you talk about it, it's just the sheer scale. You think, you think, my Lord. And so the other day I was in an outlet, 
uh, with a huge hot and cold beverage and snack offering. So, oh, that's nice. Really, that's, that's lots. Healthy food offer. They've got uh, fresh produce, you know, the yogurt and muesli. Mm, yum, yum. Salads, jolly nice. Asian and Western food beverages. Yeah, yum, yum. Uh, a noodle bar, super duper. Mm, mm, there's brekkie. Wonderful. Where was I? 7-Eleven in Hong Kong. Okay, and what does that collect? That's older people, retired people, meet each other of a morning in 7-Eleven. You can, they can actually post letters if they still want to do that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, and it, it's a, a great place. You know, it, it's, there's a social element uh, to it. 7-Eleven, you know, we tend to think, well, isn't it a convenience store? No. Anybody who goes to Thailand on a, a, a regular basis, you know, 7-Eleven in Thailand, which is owned, of course, by CP, CP is probably the biggest food manufacturer processor in, in, in Asia. There's a 7-Eleven in Bangkok every 80 meters. And you go in there, and it's about ready meals. It's about snacks. It's about food, food to go. And, you know, it's huge. So in Asia, the convenience sector is far the sector that's growing the most. And, you know, and that's where the action is. Don't look at your own convenience stores here because, you know, they're still selling pies and, uh, you know, no, not a word. How well are you represented there? And then I was just looking at the performance of Dairy Farm. I think as an Asian retailer, Dairy Farm are sort of brilliant. Uh, where are they seeing their biggest return to their back? Convenience and food service. And the uh, franchises that they have uh, on Starbucks, etc. So, you know, it's those different routes to the consumer. I think I'm almost done here. Oh, no, I haven't. This is a good part for something. So if, if I look around the, the, the world at big food, okay, big food. Remember, big food, as I mentioned earlier, has become bad food. And if you look, here we are, more consumers distrust large brands than their companies. This is, if you're looking across here, these companies, between 2012 and 17, you see, increasingly big food is seen as negative. We don't trust big food. You are part of the problem, big food, not part of the solution. Uh, and who's, who's been whacking them? Startups, those pesky, bloody millennial startups, holier than thou. And there's, uh, with, with and all the sort of things I've been talking about, so here we, it, it's often baby foods in sort of attractive packaging, which is also extraordinarily convenient. And you can, I bet your life you can probably find kale here. So here we go, kale. <laughs> Cucumber, kiwi, kale, spinach, apple and banana. And you can guarantee that the, the principal, the, the, the entrepreneur, is, is some sort of youngster who's got a mother who influenced him enormously. Uh, this is our founder, Guka, with his mum and inspiration, Nina. You know, doesn't it make you want to vomit? Uh, you know, from the US, same sort of thing. You can see the same sort of package. What's it called? Once Upon a Farm. And it's all, ah, Z, ooh, Z, you know, Z. And here are the founders in their baby clothes. Yeah. And have they seen off almost all the food sales growth in the U.S. on the last five years has come out of these firms? All the big firms have gone backwards. All of them. Every one of them. General Mills, that I mentioned, was losing like 10% per year in sales. They were just desperate. Absolutely desperate. Note the focus on the grower naturalist, few simple ingredients. Uh, a lot of it is pulses, ooh, you know, harvest snaps, not made of, you know, it's, it's all it's protein lentils, etc. Uh, and look, in the UK, UK, here's Sainsbury's, it's a significant retailer. They look to smaller brands to lead the way for them. They say the smaller brands, better innovation, and anyway, we can capture their attention and we can say, yes, only if you come in Sainsbury's, et cetera. Now, I tell you, 10 years ago, Sainsbury's had no interest in small brands. You couldn't get in, couldn't get anywhere near. And so why retailers are seeking out small brands? The big four of the same brands, the same range, the same price. It's the smaller brands that have been better at genuine innovation. They like to work with small brands uh, and it can be more regional with them. And here they are, you know, how dumb are retailers are what? What surprised us, oh my word, about working with small brands was the emotional angle. When a husband and wife have invested their life savings, you have a different emotional exposure. Oh, really? Oh, really? When you've got everything to lose, when the whole mortgage, when your house is mortgaged, of course you're bloody interested. 
And so what have they done? Every single, every single big food manufacturer has got under their wing their own venture capital company. Every one of them. And they've popped in two, three hundred million dollars and said, use that to go out and take shares in or buy these emerging companies. Because we just can't do it. We're just not fast enough. We're not quick enough on our feet. We just haven't got the right uh, R&D mix. And so, you know, here's Kraft Heinz. It's uh, with, you know, just very recent. Uh, so May 2018, that was their investment portfolio for that quarter. Egg white chips, uh, sauerkraut, whiskey dill, antioxidant this, you know. And there's uh, air-dried jerkies, etc. That's Kraft Heinz. Here's Nestle with, uh, you know, it's, you know, sweet earth, ooh, you know, blue bottle coffee company. Uh, chef cooked healthy meals called Freshly, etc. Et, et uh, Fruit bars, which you know, have just real fruit or juice. Well, why not? Uh, Mondelez here, and they want that artisanal. You know, they're seen as big food and bad food. They want the artisan reach. And did they pay you know, 500 million to buy Tate's Bake Shop? Uh, here they are again, you know, Greek hummus with olive oil and bloody quinoa. You know, the... Coca here we are in Australia, you know, kombucha. There's Coke buying uh, Mojo and you know, paying. Uh, if you were Mojo, you were pretty pleased to be bought by, by Coke, I would imagine. Perhaps they go, same thing. You can see the, the same. We've got to be in a different range of products, these all-natural overnight oats. You know, ooh, this sort of stuff that you can do well here, I would suggest. Danone with uh, iced coffees. and uh, it's, you know, it's all sort of artisan-related stuff again. General Mills, back to good belly probiotics. Uh, so, you know, this big food has been pushed into small brands, and I'm just saying there's never been a better time to be a small brand. You just have much, much more opportunities. It's the same in Australia, I'm, I'm convinced. Good Karma, here we are, Dean Foods take majority stake in dairy alternative firm Good Karma. Flax milk, etc. Here's hippies, uh, so in, in, in the US, uh, organic chickpea puffs, and, and they're very open about it. They just say, anybody want to buy us? We've got the right product. Just come and buy us. And then this one, it, don't forget, look at your product and say, does it have an animal uh, pet angle to it? Because here's, again, General Mills on the left. Just how much do they pay? Eight billion to buy blue buffalo uh, pet foods. Smuckers, you know, like a jam company, uh, buying nutrish pet food for two billion, and so I'm, I'm coming to the end. Here. I'm, I'm reminded of, about you know the emotional tug of pets. There'll be a lot of people in this room with pets. Okay, we've got pets, and my daughter-in-law was a consumer knowledge director for P and G in hair care, she knew, uh, but she also knew a lot about what. P&G were doing in premium pet foods. They're not in that now. They've sold it. Sold it. And she knows I'm interested in this. And she said, one day she said to me, oh, we've got this brilliant way for our premium pet foods of finding out who our prospective customers might be. We just asked them one question. And I said, brilliant. What's that one question? So the one question is, you know, if you've got a group, she says, how many of you celebrate your pet's birthday? And she said, no. People look around and then eventually say, half the room. And said, if you've got that emotional attachment, you'll buy our product, our premium product. Do I know that? Absolutely. Why do I know it? Because I'm away 280 days a year. I'm not proud of that. And my long-suffering wife, Susan, has been really, really good about it for 49 years, <laughs> you know, which is a considerable time. But... We've just had the straw that broke the camel's back, I'm afraid to say. Mabel arrived. <laughs> she went and got a bloody puppy. <laughs> and it's only got me to, to, to blame. And what have I noticed? There's a long line of purchases from Amazon and retail pet stores that just come every bloody day. 
And uh, yeah, premium pet food products, higher sales growth and profit than, uh, than human foods. But while I'm on that, back to you know, talking about Amazon, et cetera, and home delivery, which often is dismissed in, um, in, in Australia, saying this is Australia, David, it's quite different. Really? Well, so back, I live in Monmouth. It's a little tiny, pissy little town on the Welsh, Welsh border. There's only about 12,000 in, in, in the town. And first of all, A, Susan Hughes, long-suffering Susan, said to me, I was walking downtown with her when I was reaching at home, she's saying, it's a great shame. There's so many little, little shops are closing. You know, it's a great shame. Somebody should do something about it. And I said to her, you know, try not to be nasty, how many white vans stop at our house per week? You know, would it be 10 or 15 delivering something? You know, there are consequences to that, to Am you know, for Amazon being all empowering. So that's, that's one. Two, on that same trip, as we're walking downtown, the guy who does Amazon's business, delivery business in Little Monmouth, is driving his big van, it has to be a big van now, up our little main street. He sees Susan, he sort of stops, puts his window down and says, Susan, I've got a package. He knows that. Susan, I've got a package for you. Uh, won't give you it now because it's inconvenient. I'll leave it with Emma, our neighbor. You know, so is that scary? Well, I, I think it's, it's brilliant. And what's more, it's like it was in the 1950s. And so I mean, my last little story here, that in, when people say, no, delivery of groceries, it will never catch on here. In 1953, my mum was a teacher, uh, an infant school teacher, and so she taught me. And so during the week, she couldn't go shopping. And at the weekend, she'd put me on the back of the bike and, and she'd cycle me down the hill, like two kilometers to the little village Seascale, where, we where Mr. Barnes, the grocer, would see her coming at about 100 paces. And by the time she got to the grocery store, there'd be a chair and she, mum would sit down and they'd have a quick cup of tea and swap gossip about what was happening in school, what was happening in the village. And then Mr. Barnes, John Barnes, the grocer, uh, uh, would say, right, I know you're busy and I'm busy too. And then a one-liner which would say, same order as last week, Mrs. Hughes? And mum would say, yes, please, John. And then he'd say, oh, in 1953, there weren't many, we, there was still rationing in the UK in 1953. So, so there's, we, the two new products, I'm sure David, me, and Jennifer, my sister, would like those. And because we had reasonable income, mum would say, just pop them in the box, John. And then, Three hours later, a little boy on a bike would deliver our groceries. And we didn't think that was odd. What's more, the fish was delivered, the fruit and veg was delivered, the meat was delivered, the milk was delivered, the, uh, the pop, as we called it, the carbonated beverage was, was delivered. And all we're doing is replicating that with technology. But we're saying, ooh, I don't think so. It's all too scary. Get on. Get on for God's sake. There we go. You know, it's just, it's just a big circle. It goes around. That's what happens. So here we go. World population growing quickly. Europe flat. That's me. Economic growth rate in China raises it hugely influences food markets around the world. Whatever happens in China, it either makes you or breaks you. Pesky millennials, they're driving consumer trends and grocery change, and they've got no patience. It's about the health of me and my world. But Convenience trumps her. It doesn't matter if you've got the most convenient product in the world. Sorry, the most healthy product in the world. Sorry. If it's not convenient to buy, prepare, consume, and dispose of, you won't sell it. You won't sell it. Uh, meal patterns changing, the mini meals, healthy snacking. As I mentioned, doubling up on the five Ps. It's about values increasingly. Retail in flux, growth in discounters, online convenience, omni-channel retailing. This convergence of food retail and food service with food to go, the fastest growing sector. Who does it best? Is it supermarkets or is it other people here? Uh, and then I was doing fresh food for meat, eggs, and dairy products. And actually for almost all food products, consumers want to know who, how, and where was the product produced and what's your story? And often as not, we don't do well on the story. Got to say, bone up on that story. Get it going. And that's my lot. I think, yeah, that's my lot. There's me, smiling like a goon.
But, you know, maybe if we had a chance for a couple of questions or anything like that.